All right. So this is, I think, probably one of my favorite Q&As. This is John Wesley Ship. Um, most of you will know him for your younger audience. He plays Barry Allen's dad on the new CW's Flash. Uh, for your older audience, he was the, uh, in the 90s, he was the first Flash on TV. Uh, it was, yeah, back in the 90s, he, he was the original Barry Allen. Uh, and I actually did ask him towards the end, uh, I will ask him a question of if he's excited about Ezra Miller playing the Flash in Justice League. So that was fun. Um, he was probably one of the coolest Q&As. He was the first one we went to. Because he's like, I don't want to just stand up here on the stage or if you're going to MC down there, I'll, I'll go down there. So he ended up just walking up and down the aisle to the, anybody who asked the question. And he things was like, I'm on the aisle seats. You guys will see in this video. So he walked past me multiple times. And if you any were on my Facebook page, I posted just when we got back from the con, I said, you know, John Wesley ship smells good. Just say it. And he did. Oh, my goodness. But like I said, he walked right past me multiple times and then was standing in front of me at one point. Uh, so, yeah. John Wesley Ship, if you're watching this, I don't know what clone you're wearing, but uh, I like it. So, anyway, he's a really sweet guy. Um, check out this q and I definitely learned quite a bit just from, you know, 90s TV versus now and learning a little bit more into the DC universe. I didn't used to be a DC fan, but I think with people like him and his cast, I'm definitely getting there. So enjoy this gorgeous, aging really well man of John Wesley Ship. Sorry, guys. Yeah. 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 Are we ready? Right. Well, since you are ready, let's bring out right now Mr. John Wesley Ship! How are you? Woo! Good. What is up? Who's moderating? Well, are you going to be down there? Well, then I'm going to come down there. Uh -huh. I'll be with you in just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Don't wait. Oh, see all the Hoovians just freaked out a second there. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> dun, dun, dun. So what is up, man? We hardly need our mics. No, not really. We're loud. Yeah. How are you? Good, good. How are you guys doing? <laughs> Into my room here today. What's going on? Are you going to moderate or am I just going to... Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want to tell us stories or if they want to ask questions. Oh, okay. Well, let's just kick it off. Does anybody have anything uh, particularly that they want to, uh, to ask? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, by the way. Thank um, you. Oh, Okay, is that all right? Yeah. Um, so how does it feel, because you played Barry Allen Flash in the 90s, which is sort of a golden age compared to now, and now you play his father and the golden age Flash, you know, in, in the current series. So that, I mean, do you think much about that, or is, is you're just having fun, or right? you ever, what, what's your perspective on that? Well, it, you know, it just all kind of fits together. You know, I, I tell people, Henry Allen and the news telling is very different. Emmett Walsh was not wrongfully convicted of killing Priscilla Pointer in front of a 10-year-old me. You know, that wasn't our story. And when I heard what Jeff Johns had done with the Allen family, I thought, if they came to me, that's the role I would want. I wouldn't have particularly wanted to go right into Jay Garrick, because two reasons. I wouldn't have wanted to be in competition with myself a quarter of a century earlier. <laughs> and also, you know, a bunch of really good-looking 20-somethings running around in superhero suits. But when I heard about the new telling of Henry, and he's an Iron Heist, and Barry is the only one who believes he's innocent, I thought that would carve out uh, a unique place separate from all the fireworks, from the, you know, fun and games, from the adventure aspect, where uh, it would be a good relationship not only for Barry and Henry, but also for John and Grant. Because when all the music died down and the lights went down and he needed to get vulnerable, we needed to see who he was on the inside. This young man, you know, Barry Allen, an ordinary man dealing with extraordinary circumstances, extraordinary gifts, that when that happened, he would come to his dad. 
and we pick up the phone. Someone said, rarely has sitting down been so dramatic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'd go into the, to the phone booth at the Iron Heights and, and have a heart to heart. So, you know, I tell people I would have wanted to play Henry Allen even if I had never been Barry. The fact that I played Barry helped me play Henry better because I know what he's going through. He knew I had played the part, you know. Uh, I was identifying with his hopes and dreams. I was hoping for him to do it. We had rampant critical success. Our reviews and everything were off the roof, through the roof. But we just missed the kind of commercial success that I, at the beginning, hoped for him and that he is now having. So it's, uh, you know, one thing that I really like is a lot of fathers and sons. I get a lot of men who say, you know, I watch the, uh, they call it OG Slash. It still blows my mind. I watched the OG Flash with my dad, and now I'm watching the new Flash with my kids. And I love that about our show, that multi-generational element. That it's, you know, it's a show everybody can sit down and watch, you know, together. Thanks for that question. Anyone else? How are you, man? Uh, when you started with the character, had they already decided that you were going to then become another Earth Slash, or was it because you were such a great actor they decided we want to keep you on? I like the second answer. <laughs> no, I had no idea uh, when they brought me on. I don't know if they had thought of it then yet or not. I figured I'd have one, maybe two episodes uh, seasons as Henry Allen, as a plot device, as the place, as I said, when we need to see the interior world of Barry Allen, he could go to his dad, his uh, vulnerability. Um, and then I came to do the last four episodes together in the end of season two, and I thought, well, this is where we're going to say goodbye to Henry. And I was totally prepared for that. And then I'm in a costume fitting, and I'm trying on this shredded, you know, look like a prison outfit, but it was the wrong color. And I'm like, oh, we're doing some kind of hallucinogenic flashback of Henry and Iron Height. And then I, said that I was told, you'll be fitted for the Iron Helmet separately. And I'm like, the what? The man in the Iron Helmet? You'll be fitted for the Iron Mask separately. And I'm like, and they were like, oh my God, you don't know? And uh, then I was sitting off camera with uh, Grant and Jesse Martin. In between takes, and they said, so did you hear what you're going to be doing? And she got to the iron mask. Go figure. <laughs> and they're like, yeah, that's all you know. And I'm like, there's more? <laughs> and they said, you're the real Jake Eric. And I said, you're kidding me. How on earth? And then I talked to Greg Berlanti, who I've known since Dawson's Creek days. Oh my God, he was one of our head writers on Dawson's Creek. Um, and, uh, and he spun out the story that in the uh, span of two episodes, I would be killed as one character, I would be revealed as the man in the iron mask, who then would be revealed as the real Jay Garrick, which is the character that so many people wanted me to play to begin with. So I said to Greg, I said, take me out of the picture, that's just excellent storytelling, excellent channeling of fan expectation. But no, it was a surprise to me. I mean, I don't know if they were being, doing a bait and switch on me, you know, figuring I would I'd want to get, but I have to tell you, it was quite a confront. I was like, you want me to do what? <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and I remember Andrew Christberg said, I'm like, I, that's many years ago, man. What are you talking to? And he stepped back, he says, look at you, you're fine. You still look like a superhero. Said, All right, but everybody was very nice to me. Uh, that first day walking onto set with the one where I put on the helmet, and, you know, everybody knows it's kind of feeling a little weird about it, but they were so supportive. I mean, I look off camera and Candace Patton is going, you know, you know, and then at one point Grant brought the camera forward uh, and turned the monitor around and he said, look, look how great you look, look how great you look. And uh, everybody applauded, so uh, they, they, made it, uh, they made it more comfortable than, uh, than it possibly could have been. But I don't know that I would have said yes if it had been Jay Garrick, because it would have been too on the nose. You know, I love the fact that I essentially passed the torch, you know, as we say, 
but it wasn't on the nose. It wasn't super her to super her. It was father's son. It was like, I love you, Dad. I love you too, son. You know, right there in, in Iron Heights. And I will always cherish those Henry Berry scenes. Yeah. Also, not only for the dramatic qualities that were in them, but because of the relationship that afforded me and this new fine young actor who's, uh, who's assuming the role and has made it entirely his own. So it's very, very, very uh, happy circumstance the way it all turned out. I call Flash the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Any projects that you like to do or uh, work with people? Um, you know, it's like I, I, did, I did an episode of Blind Spot where I got to play a really bad guy this year. And about a year ago this time, I was doing 12 Angry Men at a theater in North Carolina. I have an audio drama that I've given many of you the leaflets to. It's called Powder Burns, and it's an audio western. And I play a blind sheriff in the late 1800s. And they're very atmospheric, like the old audio dramas. And we had Ed Asner come in and do, we did an episode that, that tackled aging and memory loss. And we got actually an award from the Alzheimer's Association for that episode. We also had Robert Vaughn before he passed away last year. He came on and did an episode. And we've been nominated for three voice arts awards. Hello there. <laughs> three voice, I'm sneaking up on myself. Three voice arts awards and the uh, ceremony will be held at Lincoln Center next month. So check it out, it's powderburnswest.com or you can just Google me and Powder Burns and it'll take you. We just do it for the love of it. One of my sons on One Life to Live, uh, Bob, who played Bobby Ford, my eldest son, who's a very bad dad on that show. He, uh, it's a project that he, he's doing out of love, you know, and, and wanting to get some actors, some of whom are on Broadway, and uh, yeah, two of our episodes were nominated and our casting director was nominated. Wow. So we're very pleased that it's turning out so well. Somebody else, make me stop talking. <laughs> Doing good. Hey, we, uh, so you've been around for a minute. For a minute and a half. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so we're at the Fanboy Expo, so I'm going to ask you, what's the craziest fan interaction you've ever had? You know, I don't catalog crazy. You know what I catalog are the moments, like I said, when the grown men come. Uh, there was a moment in Ecuador. We were just at an Ecuador Comic Con, and it was off the hook. Thousands and thousands of people, a mob scene all the time. And this one woman who spoke English very haltingly came up and we said hello, and she asked if she could have a hug, and I didn't. She started to, to cry. And I know whenever that happens, something is going on with the person. That ain't about me, you know. And she told me that she and her brother used to watch the show together, and he had died about a year previously. But, but you know, those kinds of connections, whether it's Kelly on Guiding Light, or Mitch Leary on Dawson's Creek, or uh, Henry Allen, you know, on some of these shows I've sort of become the father of us all, you know. Between that and getting killed and everything I do, my mom once said, is that in your contract, that you must be killed at the, with every role? She said, I can't take many more of these deaths. Yes. You spoke about the fan expectations, and we consider you a very important staple to the new series. Thank you, sir. Um, how receptive, and what are the odds of a possible spin-off? Um, I, I know nothing about I don't think that's in the cards right now, the CW being a very young network. Uh, I was, uh, someone said something to me, the costume designer, our costume designer, Kate, when I was unsure about going back into another superhero suit. She had said, I actually think it's pretty cool what you and the CW are doing, demonstrating to a young audience that you don't have to be 25 or 30 years old in order to be a superhero. Yeah. And I had to go, hmm, okay, maybe I need to put my ego, my self-centered fear to one side, you know, and that, I, I could wrap my mind around that. But no, I don't, there has been a lot of uh, buzz on Twitter, people saying that they'd like to see that. I'm always uh, very gratified by that. 
But I'll probably bounce in one or twice more, you know, as Jay Garrick on. I, I like coming back in that way. I'll tell you, I really miss Henry Allen. I'd love for him to come back somehow. I don't know any way that it could be possible. Time travel. Time travel. Yes. Yes. Comics, all things are possible. Comics like soap opera, all things are possible. You're yes. never yes. really dead. You no know, like at the speed of sound. You can literally go back in time. Exactly. I want you to write the Flash Writer's Room, and I want you to tell them what you've just told me. Yeah. Hello, Superman. I'm very glad you could make it today. I'm honored by your presence. Who else? Yes, sir. Um, I used to watch with my friends in my college dorm room, your show, and I'm kind of curious. I know how fan interactions are now. What were the fan interactions like back in your show, and what kind of access did you have to fans? Because I know that's changed radically since that time. So what was it like back then? You know, I, shooting The Flash in 1990, trying to do a superhero show of that size, with those effects in that suit, was such an enormous uh, task. It finally did us in after one season. We were the most expensive show Warner Brothers had ever done. We had a third of the back lot at Warner Brothers in L.A. Uh, uh, and we were always over budget. You know, we were shooting. I was there 55 to 85 hours a week, you know, in the suit, out of the suit, in the suit, out of the suit. And I didn't really have much time to do anything else. So a lot of people say, why doesn't Grant do more personal appearances? And, but when you're, when you're carrying a show like he is now, uh, that's an action adventure show, and you add the element of a superhero suit, it takes a lot out of you. He simply doesn't have the time. And when he has the time, he probably wants to be with his girlfriend. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, so I, I didn't have, it was just, I felt like the third week in August to the second week in the following May, uh, you know, uh, with four days off for Christmas, and that was it. I was like a runaway train. We were all hanging on trying not to fall off, you know. So, um, I, I didn't have a lot of, of fan interaction. I'll tell you what is very different, and in some ways it's easier, is that so much of the fan interaction now can happen on social media, and it's immediate. Like, I've already gotten several pictures that I've taken with people today. Uh, they put them on Twitter, and I grab them, and I, I put them in my album uh, that I do, of every wow. convention that I do, I put them on, uh, on Facebook. Um, so it's immediate, you know, we get immediate feedback. Sometimes you wish maybe it was a little less immediate, <laughs> but, <laughs> but by and large, you know, somebody said, what's the craziest fan? You know, the fan interactions that I had, and I hope it's partly what I put out, because I want to I wanna have a real interaction with the people that I meet. You know, I'm not here to put on a show or crack jokes. I mean, you know, things certainly are funny. You know what I mean? But what's important to me is feeling like, you know, that I've been seen and heard and I've been able to see and hear audience members. Many of you know more about The Flash than I do. The Flash, come on, let's face it, was 50 years old when I got to it. 75 years old by the time Grant got to it. I mean, it's quite a history to lineage. You know, the comic book audience is the keeper of the Flash flame, and we're just glad to be along for the ride. Yes. Hi. Hi. So we meet again? You made it. Put your hair down. Yeah. You're trying to trip me up here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, Quick question. I'm I'm a huge fan of both the show and the books, and I was just curious. Do you have a favorite villain, um, either that like you've read in like a book or like you've seen on the show? Or oh, I have like to say Mark. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so, uh, the trickster, yeah. because of uh, the the friendship that we've had from the first day, he blazed onto the back lot at Warner Brothers with this characterization, full blown. Not you know, I was a little bit shy about it playing a superhero on television in 1990, you know, and they promised me, they said, we won't put you in a pair of red tights, you know, it's going to be $100,000 to build four suits in 1990. I came to regret that later because of the heat, and, uh, but I was like, please, give me, just give me a pair of tights. But uh, he came in, no holes barred, 
full-blown characterization, working that unitard, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like that twister hair, as his daughter called it. She's like, I want twister hair. So they have a picture mm. of little Chelsea and Mark, and she has the rainbow-colored oh, hair. Wow. And, uh, and uh, so I have to say, Mark, it's great when he came back. You know, when he came back in that scene, <laughs> I have to tell this. And suddenly we go to Earth 3, and the color is a little bit brighter and we're up against that tile wall, and out comes Mark as the silent man version, the Earth 3 version of the trickster, and uh, or the smiling man, or whatever that silent film was. And he's coming out, and he's, you know, and I come up, and I'm catching bullets, and everything about reality is heightened, and I come up to him, and I say, you know, I say, you're out of ammo. And he goes, yeah, but I'm not out of bomb. And we're face to face, <laughs> and they yell cut, and he says, we're grown-ups. <laughs> what is it? You know, and poor Grant, you know, it's his show, right? He comes over to the Earth 3 and everything is bigger than life and I'm wearing helmets and bullets and Mark is doing his trickster thing. He was like, man, what show have I landed in? You know, a total alternate reality. Yeah. Very fond of Mark and Mary Lou and his whole family. They're, he's in New York Comic Con this weekend. Mm -hmm. oh. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Come on down. Meet me halfway. What was your favorite role to play? You know what? I always say my favorite role is the one I'm doing right now. That's the way I always look at it. Are you an aspiring actor? Uh, no. Okay. So my favorite role to play? Well, my goodness. I don't know. I've got two Emmys playing psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've been able to be an OG superhero. You know, they used to call me the classic class. I said, man, that makes me feel like an automobile. Can we come up with a different <laughs> term for that? And, uh, you know, and I got to be a drug addicted cop on NYPD Blue. I got to be the worst dad in the universe on Teen Wolf. That's so sick, I can hardly watch it, Mr. Lady. It's like, whatever. Wherever you found that in yourself, John, just keep that locked up. We don't want to see that in real life. And the world's best dad in Mitch Leary and the, the wonderful moments with, with Grant as, as Henry Allen. You know, got to do 20 award-winning play, play a Welsh wastrel in Dancing at Lunas, a wonderful Irish play that came over from the Abbey Theater. Whatever I'm doing right now is my favorite role. Right now, this is my favorite role in the sense that I want to be fully present when I'm talking to you or whatever I'm doing at that moment, you know? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what? The villains are always the roles that you get the most attention. I played a good guy on Guiding Light for four years and was never nominated for anything. And then I played a psycho for ten months on As the World Turns opposite Julianne Moore and got my first Emmy. And then I played a woman abuser on Santa Barbara for couple months and got my second in. So there, everybody thinks villains are harder, but they're, here's the catch. Villains always know what they want. They know, they come in knowing what they want. A specific agenda, they know exactly what they're willing to do to get it. And they move the plot. The, the challenge with playing a leading man, particularly if it's your series over 23 episodes, is how do you, you're acted upon a lot by the villains. And how do you keep that active? And the other challenge is for the writers, because writers love to write villains, you know. I mean, who doesn't want to write uh, for Mark Hamill or, you know, in, 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 in our show, Brian Cranston or Michael Champion or, you know, all these wonderful actors that we had. And, uh, you know, playing, uh, playing the good guy for me, I don't know what that says, wait a minute, should I say this out loud? <laughs> Playing the good guy for me is more difficult in many ways, even though the villains win the awards and the villains are the flashy parts. <laughs> is there any uh, merit to talk of you joining like, Legends of Tomorrow or any other show? Is there any talk of me joining Legends of Tomorrow? Last year, they structured our contracts and I was hoping it would happen so that they could move us across the platforms. It didn't end up happening. In Legends, they had a speedster board, the lineage of speedsters, and I was on that as Jay Garrett. 
I'd love to go play with Brandon and Victor Garber and those guys. That'd be a fun sandbox to go play in for an episode or two. It hasn't happened yet, but... Okay, listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. My friend uh, Joe, who was uh, moderating one of my uh, events, he, uh, somebody asked something, if something was going to happen, and he has this great phrase, if you want to see it, tweet it. Okay. Tweet the Flash writer's room. Tweet the CW Flash. Believe me, they have people who comb fan mail, and modern day fan mail, as I said, is social media. So they are listening to what you guys say. And uh, so if you want to see it, tweet it, you know. Well, yes. we don't have phones. What if you don't have phones? Well, then you're going to have to talk to your neighbor. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're just going to have to go knock on the door. Yeah. So as an actor, um, I was wondering, do you recall your first audition when you got into the Hollywood scene? Mm -hmm. oh. You felt about all that. Let me see, what would that be? I moved... Okay, hold on to your hat. I'm older than everybody in this room. And hold on to your cow. Um, I, uh, I moved to New York in the late 70s. Uh, and uh, I did industrial films. I did, I'm a relic. I did Showtime's first original movie for television. They did the best off-Broadway series that year. Uh, they did The Passion of Dracula, uh, me and Mike, and, uh, and right after that was Guiding Light. You know, I've been auditioning for things as long as I can remember, and it never, it never gets easier. There's always that thing of, you know, I just can't go in there and put myself on the line one more time. You know, we spend a lot more time looking for work. They say an actor's work is his holiday. You know, what? Well, there's a great story about John Gilgood. He's waiting in the trailer for a film, and and he's waiting and waiting and waiting. And somebody comes and knocks on his door of his trailer. He says, "Oh, Sir John, we're so sorry. We've kept you waiting so long." And he said, "Nonsense, dear boy. This is what you pay me to do. The acting is for free." So that's sort of the, the attitude to have. Yes, Wonder Woman. Meet me halfway. Come on down. There's you. You know, the last shot of Flash 1991, Mark Hamill and I, five in the morning, somewhere in Southeast LA. I do the last shot of the series, I rip the wings off, threw them in the air, and swore I would never again get into another superhero suit. <laughs> of course, Mark almost lost his mind. He was like, don't let those wings get away. You know, he's climbing around trash cans and over cables. He has those wings. Um, so, you know, once I stepped out of that, I would, I would have been fine if the TV series had decided that they wanted to go an entirely new way and cut with the past. I'm glad that I was integrated in a way that was not token, that was meaningful. You know, I helped move the plot forward as Henry Allen in a role that was very different from, from my series. Um, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't say no, but I'm not holding my breath. They want to keep the universes uh, right now separate. Ezra has said, wouldn't it be great to have a shot with the three of us? But, um, you know, I'm not anticipating that. If it happens, it'll be, you know, a gift, uh, uh, you know, uh, but, but, but we'll see. But I'm totally fine with it. No, playing Flash for one hard season, you know, I felt, I felt flashed out at that point. Not, no one was more surprised than me when they said, okay, now you're going to be another Flash. Hi. Um, I think you just kind of answered my question, but I'm going to ask anyway. So, I have run-on answers. Well, so, <laughs> <you notice? laughs> well, I was just wondering, you know, I'm hearing you talk a lot about the 90s flash and everything. If it were to come up because of the multiverse, would you be willing to portray the 90s flash with Grant's flash? Maybe through the miracle of CGI and computer generation. <laughs>
<laughs> they reach back into those files and bring them forward. Um, it's very funny. I was sitting in an interview with Andrew Kreisberg, one of our executive producers, and he had said, at one point, we were considering putting John back in the original suit. And I snapped my head around and looked at him. He said, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I'm sure it would be much, much more comfortable now if they chose to do that. There's been an astounding amount of, uh, of, of Twitter activity wanting to see it. If you guys don't stop it, I'm going to end up back in that original suit. <laughs> Who else? Yes. Mm-hmm. Speaking of the Justice League, are you excited to see what Ezra does yes. with the Flash? Very much, very much. Hi. I'm on the, I, you know, it's, it, as I said, it was I was the only live action Flash for 24 years. Wow. So by the time they finally got it together to do a new Flash, man, I was ready. Yeah. You know, and of course, you know, one thing is there's a very similar dynamic in between soap opera audiences and comic book audiences. Both are fiercely loyal, fiercely dedicated, and they know their lineage and their legacy. So when a new project is announced, there is inevitably a grumble that goes up. Well, we don't know about this. Well, he's so young. Well, he's too this. Well, he's too that. Well, he played a villain in Glee. How could he be a superhero? I'm yeah. Wait a minute, I played two psychos on my way to Flash, you know. Uh, so actually he's carrying on a tradition. We're all very big on tradition in here, right? And, uh, and so I was delighted, particularly when I saw Grant on uh, Arrow. And I thought, man, it's just sincerity. You know, there's no acting. Or rather, it's the highest form of acting, which is just truth. People say, what's Grant like? I say, what you see is what you get. There's very little artifice. I keep waiting for an actor of his age to have a false moment. And at least the times I, granted, I'm not there all the time, but the times that I've been there, I haven't been able to find one. He just, you know, the thing about those scenes is we just got to pick up the phones and just look at each other and tell the truth. And that's, that's the best form of acting. So from that perspective, yeah, I'm ready to see Ezra. Did you guys notice that at San Diego Comic-Con, Ezra showed up to his panel in cosplay oh. with yellow hair and a white raincoat? you got to warm to that. Yeah. You have to warm to that kind of enthusiasm. You know, 25 years ago, 27 years ago now, when I started The Flash, you wouldn't have dared done that. No. It would have been considered so uncool. Man, you must be so proud of yourselves because... The rest of the entertainment industry has finally caught up with you. So, give yourselves a hand. From what I understand, Grant is, is looking forward to it too. You know, it's like these are huge stories with a tremendous lineage that have gone on for decades and decades and that will continue after Grant, Ezra, and I or have passed from the scene. So yeah, let's see a different take. I hope everybody in this room will go support that movie. I'm gonna be sitting there to see what he does, you know? I mean, that's why there can be different flashes. These stories are universal. It's like when they said to me, play a superhero, I was like, uh, I don't know. And they said, John, just read Danny Bilson and Paul DeMeo's script. And I read the script and I said, oh, it's not. You Hollywood superhero, you know, it's the unblessed son of a cop family where real cops work the streets. And I go to work the crime lab so that my mother won't sit up nights worrying that I'm going to be killed, you know. And my older brother Jay is the blessed son because he is a street cop. And then I undergo this accident and all this stuff starts happening. I've totally resigned myself to being the ordinary one, (laughs) the non-extraordinary one in the family. Uh, you know, my dad, Ezra, uh, not Ezra, Emmett, always saying, what you got to do? Stump his foot on a footprint, you know? And I was totally, totally, as Barry, consigned to that. Suddenly I get these powers. What does he do? Not, I'm going to go be a hero. It's like, I want to get rid of him. He goes, Tina McGee, I don't care. I don't want this. I don't want a note from it. I don't want to be your guinea pig. You figure out a way for me to get rid of this. And that's the deal. Then my brother gets killed. 
you know, who in spite of the fact that he was the blessed son and I was the unblessed son, we had a very tight relationship. And working with Tim Thomerson, mm -hmm. I was just sorry he couldn't continue because that was that relationship was pure gold. But he gets killed. And then Barry goes, okay, holding my dead brother on the side of the road, I decide, all right, I'm going to own these powers and I want to symbol, you know, to mimic the, the paint splotch that they would throw up against the police station when they attacked. I want to strike fear into their hearts. I want to cow so no one can see who I am. And I'm going to use these powers to avenge my brother's death. Well, these are themes of classical drama, folks. You know? So of course you could have more than one person play it. You know? Thanks. Good question. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Who does? You know, it's like I said, I love those father-son scenes with Henry and, uh, and Barry, you know, I thought they were so good. I loved saying to him, after I already knew he was the Flash, but he was still denying that he was, and I got to say, well, yeah, I know, wink, wink, nod, nod, but if the Flash were my son, I'd tell him a few things. I'd tell him he's a hero, and he's saving a lot of lives. I'd tell him to be careful, because it's a dangerous world out there. But most of all, I want him to know that his dad is proud of him. You know, so I have to say that that first season was really very special to me. Now it's fun and games, man. <laughs> it's like Grant and I get out there in our superhero suits, you know, and, and run around. What was your favorite? The second, the second season. Cool. Cool. A lot, a lot of stuff went down in that second season. Yeah, as I understand it now, in the beginning of the third season, because we went way far out with Savitar, multiple Earths, overlapping timelines, they're going to bring it back now to core, the core characters. I mean, clearly, this show is called The Flash, and The Flash is Grant's Barry Allen. So we need to, you know, invest in, in, and focus on him, and I think we're going to get, get back to some more of that. Anyone else? Thank you for that question. Yes. It's not flash related. <laughs> when you first got into acting and you got to the point where you thought in your head, I can make a living at this, what was the first thing you bought just for fun, just for yourself? Oh, that's you had such a good question, Ooh, and man. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was, I didn't buy it, but I got a new apartment pretty soon, right away. You know, I was uh, in the late 70s living in my fifth floor walk up. You know, you go up all the floors of the brownstone, and then you go up to the servants' quarters. My favorite thing in those days was, was climbing out on the eaves and sitting up on the gables and looking out over 74th Street in Manhattan and thinking about what it would be like to be a successful actor and would I ever be able to make a living at it and would I ever be on Broadway. You know, all those dreams that young actors dream. And, uh, and you know, so much of it has come true. I'm just extraordinarily grateful. And, and one thing I also thought right away, because my family is very close, and I thought, oh man, the vacations we're going to be able to have, the things <laughs> I'm going to be able to buy for my mom, the things that, you know, the fun things that if this goes the way it looks like it's going, I'm going to be able to afford to do that my, we might not have been able to afford to do otherwise. So that, that's been uh, one of the biggest thrills for me. Thanks. Yes, anyone? Did I just bring the whole room down in a quiet <laughs> family story? This young man right here. Stand up, sir. Please. Here you go. What was your favorite scene? My favorite scene? I just I think I've just played the whole scene right over there. <laughs> Sure. The, you know, I love the episode, and I'll tell you why I love that scene and why I remember that scene probably the most. You know, every time Grant and I would do a father-son scene, we'd think, well, that's the only way that, uh, there are no more ways that scene can be done. And then there would be the moment when I was shanked in Iron Heights, because I'm working with Joe behind Barry's back to help solve crime on the inside. I end up in the infirmary, and I got the flash on the newspaper, and I'm showing him, you know, I'm wanting him to... But I don't pull his covers when I realize he's not ready to tell me. I just 
opened the door with the lines I recited over there. I opened the door this much so that when he was ready to tell me, he could walk through the door. And he did that in the Trickster episode where I'm, how often do you get to be saved from a box of knives? You know? <laughs> you gotta love this world. I'm sitting under a box of knives and, you know, the Trickster's, uh, the end of Penn Reality. Barry comes in and he whisks me out. Finally, he's ready. And he trans Grant transformed into like a 12 year old. He gets this look on his face and he pulls the cow back like, gee, Dad, look what I can do, you know? And my line was, well, you always did look good in red. <laughs> yeah.